Hi, I'm Daniel Schoenwössel, a Cloud Platform Architect from Red Hat. Today, I would like to introduce you to OpenShift Virtualization. To make things more interesting, I would like you to meet Bob. Bob is a seasoned virtualization engineer. He has a knack for solving complex infrastructure problems and is known for his quick wit and love for coffee. His latest challenge? He needs to deploy a Windows-based application. It's crucial for the company's growth. Here are the opportunities for his company. The company is rapidly evolving, and so are the IT needs. They're transitioning from traditional VM setup to a more dynamic, scalable environment with OpenShift virtualization. Bob is skilled with virtualization, but new to OpenShift virtualization. His goals? He wants to be able to efficiently migrate his existing virtual machines, integrate the new Windows application, and seamlessly operate virtual machines and containers alongside the same platform. All right, Bob is discovering how we can see the world with OpenShift virtualization. For this, let's dive into the demo. Before we can access the cluster, we have to log in into the web interface. And in this case, OpenShift virtualization. Once we log in, we can see a nice dashboard, which Bob can see all the critical information about the cluster, activity logs, details, the version, as well as cluster utilization. There's a section that shows you the status of every single component of your cluster, including some insights that help you tune your cluster. When we hop over to virtualization, which extended our cluster, we are created with another dashboard, giving us an overview of our virtualization workloads. Here we can see we do not have any virtualized workloads running at this moment. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to take advantage of our existing templates and create virtual machines. Like you learned, Bob wants to understand what can this platform offer as he's not familiar with it. His first task is to create a very simple virtual machine. In this case, we're going to create a simple Linux VM utilizing our catalog. Without making any customizations, we want to see what it looks like when we spin up our virtual machine. As you can see, very briefly, we created the virtual machine. Now it is starting. And before you know it, it will be running. Now, the next responsibility for Bob to discover is how can he run his Windows VM. Now that the Linux VM is running, let's create another VM. In this case, we're going to pick Windows 2019. For this VM, we uploaded our installation medium. We're going to select it, and we have it in our OpenShift operating system images namespace. Here we find Windows 2019, and again, we're not going to make any further customization and create our Windows VM. Now, similar to the Linux VM, our Windows VM is starting up. This process takes a little longer. While we're waiting for this, let's dive in and take a look at what could we customize if you wanted to go a little deeper. Let's create another Linux VM, probably is a good idea. And in this case, what we're going to do is change the name. We change it to Linux VM just to make it easy. And we're going to customize further settings. Remember when we set the install media for Windows, we could do the same thing here. But in this case, the template provides us a default. We'll keep it that way. Now we can further customize settings such as CPUs available to our VM. We'll just double it. Scheduling, what node should this particular virtual machine run on? We have obviously all the nodes in the cluster available. Some of them might not be suitable for the workload due to licensing or other restrictions. Or we might want to pin it to a node that has a GPU we want to take advantage of. If you want to do best practices and externalize our secrets and configurations from the virtual machine, we could, in this case, change the environment to make those available. By default, our virtual machine joins our pod network, the network that Kubernetes uses to allow our workloads, our applications to communicate. 
but we could also add this virtual machine to our corporate network by extending a further network interface that might have a VLAN for this particular workload. We're not going to do that at this moment. Now, similar to our network, we can add additional disks, such as for our data. If we have a database and we want to have a particular size disk or particular performance, we could add a second disk. Let's go ahead and add just the default settings, a 30 gig disk to our virtual machine. As you saw, with a few clicks, we were able to self-serve disk creation. Now, all the resources are configured. Now we're talking about installation. I want to make sure that we can configure our virtual machine in an automated way. And for this, we can use Cloud Init on Linux and SysPrep for Windows. We're not going to make any customizations right now, but be aware that you can take advantage of these features and we'll see that later in the demo. Now, once you have your user, you want to potentially change the user credentials to log in and you can do that here as well. Last but not least, we have the ability to configure our metadata. So this metadata is really, really helpful for automation. These labels we can see here allow us to later choose the particular VM for services such as load balancers and other utilizations from a application lifecycle perspective. So here we're going to make no changes, but you can see that we have the app equals Linux VM as one of the labels to give you an example. Now we create the VM and as you can see again, very simple and very quick, the VM is starting and we have it running momentarily. The great thing is the Windows VM is running as well. Now that we have seen how we can create our virtual machines, how about the table stakes? How do we make sure that our normal utilization of our virtual machine environment are available? Well, one of the things we could take a look at is what is the utilization of the resources we gave our Windows VM? Cool thing you can see here is we have access to a preview window as well as the console. In addition to that, we can see on the overview screen CPU, memory, and storage utilization, as well as our network traffic. This VM just started, so the data has not populated yet. Now, we have further details. Over time, we can see long-term metrics for the same metrics we just saw. Now, if I wanted to connect to the Windows VM, I can either do it through this console or connect remote through the desktop VM. Now this covers the majority of our access to the virtual machine. But now if I wanted to choose a different host to run the virtual machine, because I might want to take the server down for maintenance or I want to take advantage of other resources or better balance our workloads, I would potentially go in and migrate a virtual machine from in this case, our node zero one to one of the other two nodes. Now, if I want to take a snapshot of a virtual machine in order to potentially protect a change to the virtual machine and be able to roll back, I can do this very easily through our snapshot feature. Now, I think we covered most of the table stakes. Bob is pretty impressed. As you could see, Bob was able to spin up these three VMs in less time than it takes him to drink a cup of coffee. Now, what about all the other VMs? Remember, Bob was asking about migrating a whole fleet of VMs. Let's have a look at what we could do here to help Bob. The good thing is Bob already set up all the necessary providers. So a provider allows us to configure the credentials to connect to our hypervisor. In this case, we have our source cluster and the target cluster, which is this local host. Now, to migrate a virtual machine, we need to know what the source storage configuration is. And for this, we created a mapping between the source storage and the destination storage. Similarly, we mapped the source network to our cluster network. Now with both of those mappings in place and the providers pre-configured, we can create a plan to execute the migration. So simple form to populate, the plan needs a name. We need to choose our source and target, and then we can choose a namespace in which we want to import those new virtual machines. Good thing is with the API, we have access to interrogate our cluster and see there's four VMs that are ready for migration. We're going to select all VMs. 
And now that the mappings are pre-configured, we can choose which mapping we want to use for this particular plan for both storage and network. We have two options to migrate our virtual machine, either a cold migration, which requires the VM to be shut down and we copy the data and bring it back up in the new environment or a warm migration where most data is copied ahead of the shutdown, final data is copied and then the VM is brought up after it's restarted. Now, if you use automation, you can take advantage of these hooks to perform certain tasks during the migration. With all settings configured, the plan is ready to commit. And with a final view, we agree that this is what we want to start. Now, the migration of those virtual machines starts and it takes a little bit of time to copy. Some of those VMs have up to 90 gigs of disk. So we'll keep this in the background running, but as you can see, migration started. Now that was fairly easy considering that we have to not do much ourselves. Now, this is wonderful. Bob's happy to see that the task of migration will not take much of his time and he can grab another cup of coffee. Before we move on, I would like to show you some automation. Bob was curious how a modern virtualization platform can allow him to perform a lot of the normal tasks in an automated fashion and how he can integrate his Windows VM using infrastructure as code to a new stack for his search index. For this, I prepared some automation. This automation allows us to configure the entire stack for our application using text files. You saw the artwork project earlier for our virtual machine import, we're going to use it this time to create a brand new application stack. And we're in the developer perspective, different from the administrating, uh, administrative perspective we saw earlier, where we can see the creation. Now, we have a text file that we can drag and drop into our UI and then execute. It will create a number of different objects between services, like a load balancer, we'll look into that later, configuration maps to externalize configuration, we talked about that for the virtual machines, and so on, including our virtual machines themselves. All right, wonderful. Now that we got this done, let's click back onto the topology, choose our project that we just created, and we can see that with this automation, we not only created our virtual machines depicted with the square boxes, containerized components, in this case, an API gateway, our coordinator node for our index, our web-based application to consume the data, a graphical user interface, as well as for good measure, a Linux box. All this was created with text file only. But as you mentioned, as you probably remember, Bob wanted to also run a Windows VM. So we're gonna add that next. For this, we open up our import again, drag a Windows VM declaration, including a auto unintended XML configuration map that will be available for sysprep to answer the installation questions. As you can see, all these resources were added and like we would like to see them, they are nicely organized from a graphical perspective together as the application stack. Now, this VM is going to install itself as it utilizes sysprep with our configuration map attached. While this is running, let's have a look. We think we have all the components in place to run our application stack, but how does the user get access to our application running on this stack? Well, we would want to be able to access it through our network. I mentioned earlier that we can take labels to configure services. Let's take a look at how our services are attached to this stack. So when I hop over to services and select our project, we can see that there is a service representing all major components. We talked about a graphical user interface, our data generator application, the coordinator API gateway, and each of our virtual machines, as well as a combined service for Elasticsearch. Let's take a look at this particular service. Remember the labels? We were able to specify labels on our virtual machines. In this case, the labels are app equals Elasticsearch 
and then Elasticsearch equals role, in this case, master. Those two labels are used in the selector to identify what VMs will provide this service. And as we can see, all our three VMs are available. Now, with all services similarly configured, and we saw how it works for our Elasticsearch application, how does the external service become accessible to our customers? Well, we have our coordinator node, which has an external facing URL that is backed, for instance, with our coordinate service. Similarly, we have our Elasticsearch nodes as well as our Elasticsearch service. And do you remember, we just looked at the Elasticsearch service and it's mapped to our route. So with all routes, the services are exposed external to the cluster and with the services they're exposed within the cluster to be resolved. Now, you might wonder what happened to our Windows VM. Let's take a look at the virtualization space again. And we can see our Windows VM that is self-installing is still running the installer. Wonderful. The other elements I want to cover before we wrap up for today is that we have the ability to externalize our secrets and configuration maps on these Linux VMs. Here, we have in addition to the configurations a dedicated data disk for Elasticsearch that we can save away and take snapshots off independent from our operating system. We can also see that we have Elasticsearch YAML. That's the configuration file that's unique for each node as an environment variable injected and consumed inside as a virtualized disk. But Elasticsearch was installed using the install script environment variables. And then we have Let's Encrypt, which is our SSL certificate that's used to serve the web content securely. These were made available as environments, as two configuration maps and one secret. Wow, that was a lot. I hope you followed along and enjoyed a little glimpse into what we can do with OpenShift virtualization. Now that we wrap up, I would like to remind you what you saw today. You noticed hopefully that Bob was able to deliver a value to the business without a typical friction. As you have seen with this brief demonstration, we cover the table stakes for running virtual machines. You can improve and import existing virtual machines and create them manually or with automation. Virtual machines can run alongside containerized application and serverless in one platform. This allows for easier application modernization and adoption of container technology. And for Bob and his company, well, he transformed from a traditional VM engineer to a cloud savvy architect. He succeeded and revolutionized IT infrastructure. The new application is running flawlessly. The infrastructure is set up with efficiency and scalability. His bosses are thrilled. And how about Bob himself? Well, for his innovative approach, he got a well-deserved promotion to lead cloud platform architect. A title he humbly accepts with a witty remark about needing a bigger cup for coffee. Thank you for your time.